Welcome to the College Game Day Podcast, March Madness Edition. Uh, I'm your host, not nearly with as good of hair as Reese Davis, not nearly with the Pocket Square collection. He may actually have like a house behind his house with just pocket squares in them. Uh, Reese Davis is off tonight, and uh, I am joined by the great Jeff Borzello, uh, watching six games right now and recalculating Ken Palm in front of him. Uh, off of a weekend of four straight days, a great, the beautiful binge of March Madness. Jeff, welcome to the College Game Day Podcast. Yeah, excited to be here. I, I'm doing my best to replace Reese's hair uh, yeah. as, his, as his substitute for the day. Yeah, Reese would actually have an opinion on your hair. I really don't. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, I'm sure he will be. He will be listening here through. Um, we have some. Uh, we have some bad hot takes that Reese and I had on our last pod that we will uh, that we will get to. But Jeff. As we've discussed intermittently the last few days, for as glorious as the NCAA tournament is, and for as glorious as the Oakland story and the Yale story and all these stories, there is one story in college basketball looming over it all right now, a big, dark, blue cloud, and that is the future of John Calipari at Kentucky. So we have to start there. I feel like there's really nowhere else to start. And I guess as the Oakland game as they're holding on, as you see sort of that look of angst on Cal's face, and there were some great looks, the like the the really rich people behind the Kentucky bench, they all just looked like mortified. <laughs> it was like it was like they had collectively seen ghosts. So as this is unfolding, what's your visceral reaction to John Calipari's future at Kentucky at that point? That it was going to be a very noisy next few days in Lexington. I mean, it's just and you heard the whispers kind of all season, even leading up to the tournament when they were playing well that there were still a segment of people of Kentucky fans and Kentucky people that weren't happy with Cal and an early exit, you know, was going to put him, you know, back in the crosshairs. And it's, you're thinking, okay, well, they're a three seed. They, they're playing really well. They're playing Oakland and early exit's not going to happen. And then it happens. And it's just it, almost right away. It just, you know, things start snowballing. You, you know, everybody's talking about his buyout and how much he has left on his contract and who, who could they hire if he leaves and, you know, do they fire him tonight? It's just, it, it, and it was very predictable. You knew as soon as they lost in the fashion they lost in, you know, in another upset where their freshmen don't play well, you immediately knew the narratives, you immediately knew the the storylines. And then he didn't help himself in the press conference. Um, at least I don't think he did by basically saying, you know, hey, maybe maybe we don't need to, to go in the portal. Maybe we do. And, you know, college basketball suddenly got old, which, you know, it didn't really suddenly go, get old. It's been happening <laughs> for four or five years now. Um, he was oddly upbeat too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, (laughs) it was, was, I mean, the players seemed this kind of distraught about it. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, so it was kind of a, a, you know, one thing after another that night that you kind of just saw coming as Reed Shepard missed a shot as Dillinger missed a shot as every, uh, Golki three pointer went in, you just kind of saw all this stuff coming. Yeah. And I think we're in for a fascinating, 72 hour stretch here because i feel like if he comes back and it may not be 72 hours could be a couple weeks and uh we will get to potential cal destinations and then potential cal replacements um as we go on here because they're all fascinating like all these questions are fascinating and very expensive like you said 33 million dollars is the uh is the bio as of late sunday night jeff do you think there's a chance john calipari gets fired by kentucky this week i think there's a chance um i don't think it's very likely Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think there's a chance. And and like I said, I mean, there's been people that have not been happy with him for a couple of years and he's, you know, publicly, you know, taken, taken shots or taken stances against, you know, the football program and, and has said things that, uh, athletic director, Mitch Barnhart has not liked. So it's, you know, there, he's alienated some people there. And then you kind of throw this, the upset this year, the upset Mm -hmm. of St. Peter's, you can kind of just see things there's going to be money people that are going to say, Hey, we, we, we have enough money. If, if we really want to fire him, we can do it. And so I do think that there is a chance um, that he's coached his last game at Kentucky. Again, I don't, I don't think it's likely, but I think there's definitely a chance that, that he's, that his time in Lexington is over. Yeah. It's interesting. You brought up the, uh, the Mitch Barnhart backing Mark Stoops over John Calipari. Because I think when we when we look back at Cal's tenure, however it ends, whether soon or much later, I thought that was a pretty important mile marker. Because four years prior to that, and that was in uh, summer of 2022, there was a series of back and forths about Kentucky being a football school, not being a football school. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But basically, 
the athletic director, Mitch Barnhart, who says very little publicly, very little publicly, and is not a, uh, he's a calculated guy and he's a lay low, don't make the big mistake guy. And him going out and backing Mark Stoops, who, by the way, has done a wonderful job there, was was one of those moments where you're like, whoa, he's going with Kentucky's like generally successful and overachieving football coach over their Hall of Fame and typically superlatively successful basketball coach. It was just a little bit one of those things where you're like, hmm, this this indicates where the where the wind is, uh, where the wind is blowing a little bit. Um, so in the basketball world, a lot of our listeners, Jeff, are, are football are football folks, um, though we have plenty of basketball fans too. Um, there is, of course, like, look, Texas A&M would pick its teeth with a $33 million buyout. That's just like a, this is like a buyout appetizer. What's the real buyout? Uh, what is that number? It, you know, you deal in these coaches' contracts constantly. What does that number mean when you look at thir- look down the barrel at $33 million? I mean, as far as I know, it would be the most – that a, a basketball program has owed their coach to fire him. Now it's not one, they don't have to write a $33 million check tomorrow to fire him. It's owed. It, he's owed that over the length of his contract, which makes it a little more palatable. But at the end of the day, it's still, he's owed 33 million to fire him. And at some point they're gonna have to pay that. Now there's an offset in there with where if he gets another job, then, you know, they wouldn't have to pay him that, which is, I don't know where he would go right now, but, you know, if there was an opportunity for him to go somewhere and make six, seven, eight million dollars, I'm sure Kentucky that, that might make Kentucky's decision a little bit easier. Um, but I don't see that as overly viable right now. So I do think they'd be on the hook for the majority of that 33. And, and the other part of it is it's not just the money they have to pay him. And we'll get to the some of the candidates shortly, but a lot of them are going to have eight figure buyouts. And so you're throwing that on top of whatever you owe Cal. Then you're throwing on a salary, which if you're going to Kentucky, you're probably going to demand you know, seven million dollars, six to seven million dollars. And so then you gotta pay the staff. You're gonna have to fund some sort of NIL. I don't think a lot of guys are going anywhere now without you know at least mm-hmm. promises for for NIL funds. You're you're talking a huge, huge payday, even if it's not 33 up front, you're still talking 20 plus million dollars in kind of you know short order. And that's that's still a lot of money, especially on the basketball side. You mentioned Texas AM. There's been big buyouts in football. We generally don't see that sort of thing in basketball. I mean, we saw a little bit with Vanderbilt and Jerry Stackhouse, but sure. it's not a, you know, we're not seeing every year, we're not seeing 20 million plus buyouts being paid to fire coaches. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting. So I think there's one place in this cycle that could hire John Calter. But I really think, you know, it would be a wondrous marriage of desperation and opportunism, right? Like SMU has the money. Like mm-hmm. they could pay him twelve million. They could pay him twenty million. I mean, they basically got a bunch of guys together in the room at the country club, and they threw in the hat to like pay ten years of rights fees to go to the ACC for free, right? So like that is like these are billionaires with a, with a B, and David Miller of at the, at the front of the line with them. And um, what what how is the SMU job viewed right now? I guess they they fired Rob Lanier, a very good coach who won twenty games this year. Um, and it was a little jarring to see. It's like whoa, you know, like. And I think that's sort of the the the, the blind ambition that, that SMU shows. But like, how is that job viewed as a, as a basketball job? It's had some dollops under Larry Brown, but I don't know mm-hmm. if it's I don't know if it's ever been viewed as like a juggernaut job. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, when they fired Rob Lanier last week. I mean, the the calls I got were kind of surprising in terms of guys that would be interested in the job. Um, it's view. I mean, obviously, it's in a good city mm-hmm. in Dallas, which is a recruiting a fertile recruiting area. You can recruit pretty much all of Texas. They have a ton of money, as, as you mentioned, great resources, good NIL um, in theory. And they've been the, NIL for a while before it right. was called that, as <laughs> as the 30 for 30s have taught us. So uh, and they're going to the ACC. So so some of the, the negatives that they had uh, before this coming summer are not going to be there anymore. And in the ACC, they're having a great tournament. But I think it's still viewed by a lot of coaches as a league where you can come in and you can still you can compete and finish top half in that league pretty quickly. Um, and so it's, there's going to be guys that want that job, guys that are at sitting power five, high major programs right now, they're going to be interested in that job. And again, they can pay a lot and they have the resources and the funding to kind of keep this thing going. I mean, they, facilities are great. I mean, Rob Lanier won 20 games this past season and SMU, mm-hmm. so this is not good enough. And so I, it seems to me, I mean, especially based on what the, the AD said when they fired him, they basically said, Hey, we're, we're going into the SEC. We want to get a heavy hitter to come in and, and we think we should be competing with the best of the best. And this is our chance to. Do you think Cal would leave 
without getting fired because 33, like, like he earned that lifetime contract and it, again, he could potentially equal his pay, I'm sure at, at SMU. But do you think his ego would allow him to, to just leave Kentucky in a lurch um, in a hailstorm of Jack Gokey threes? I say no. Um, I, I think. Do I think he's incredibly happy there right now? Probably not. I mean, mm-hmm. especially with the way that that the fans are treating him. But I think his his ego would say, "I don't want to go out like the way that, like the way I went out." Mm-hmm. And also, I believe that my way works, mm-hmm. and I want to show the Kentucky fans that my way can work. I, you know, he showed that he's flexible with playing style. I mean, this year they were playing faster and shooting threes, and kind of took the shackles off offensively. Can he? can he be flexible in terms of roster construction? And I, I don't know if he wants to be, but if he does, then I think he would rather show Kentucky fans, Hey, I can do it here as opposed to starting fresh at SMU. If he's willing to change. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's pretty fascinating. We we were talking earlier today, Jeff, and I gave, there are some similarities to John Calipari and Jim Harbaugh. Yep. They tend to wear out their welcome. And cloud storms tend to follow them. Obviously, we saw it with Calipari at uh, UMass. We saw it with Calipari at Memphis. Uh, there are no storm clouds now. You know, as he would be quick to point out, they were all in Louisville recently more than uh, <laughs> more than they were uh, more than they were at Kentucky. But he is like I think they're similar in the way that they're singular forces, and they are people that don't often play well with others, don't sometimes play well with bosses. And I mean, like Harbaugh, like they couldn't wait to get rid of him with the 49ers. Guy had the highest winning percentage in the entire NFL during the four years he was there. And they couldn't wait. Like they were giddy to get rid of him. Now, I don't think John is that divisive, but I think John Calipari can wear you down. And I, I feel like that's where the Kentucky money people, uh, administrators, fan base is with him right now. There's just, you know, it's just a, a little bit of the same tired stuff. And the performances, quite frankly, have all been. I think similar, right? It's been right. I mean, if, if he was if he was making these these demands or these comments about NIL and facilities and things like that when they were going to Final Fours and going mm-hmm. to Elite Eights and winning thirty games, I think there's a different reaction when you're getting knocked out of the tournament by fourteen and fifteen seeds, and then you're complaining about NIL and you're complaining about facilities and you're complaining about what football has compared to you. It just there's an incredibly different reaction to it, um, and it's obviously it's negative. And, and like you said, the money people are going to say. You can't make these demands when you're when you're putting up, you know, first round exits every year in the tournament. Scott Frost summed up his demise better than any coach uh, I I can ever remember, the old Nebraska coach. They kept losing these close games and he called it the same movie. He's like, we're seeing the same movie. And I feel like with Kentucky, we've seen the same movie as the as these seasons have uh, ended. And, you know, it hasn't only been the NCAA tournament, too. They've been awful in the SEC tournament the past couple of years. Um, They haven't uh, they haven't done well in the postseason. Um, If this was college football, Jeff, they would they would fire the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator (laughs) and to save the buyout money and bring in the generally, um, you know, to keep the generally successful coach there for for a little while longer. Um, if there are staff changes, do you think Cal would be open to them? Because those dudes have been sitting on his bench for a long time. And that's just not like La Familia. La Familia ain't, you know, <laughs> ain't hitting one of your own, right? And that's that that's that's what would have to happen, be yeah. it uh an Antigua, Chuck Martin, a Bruiser Flint, somebody like that. Now there are there's a little bit of new blood on there, but do you think that is like a we're going to we're we're going to come back with a plan to show our fan base that this isn't the same movie? Do you think that's a, a needle thread that's available here? I think so. And I think Cal would have to be, you know, open to that. And they, you're, you're allowed to have five assistant coaches now on the side, which could make it a little bit easier. And you don't have to get rid of, you know, your whole staff. You can get rid of one or two, bring in some fresh blood and, and kind of refresh things. And so, you know, again, I, I think if they're going to say, hey, you have to refresh your staff or you're getting fired, I, I feel like he would rather refresh his staff than, than get fired again. And he's going to make money either way because if he gets fired, he's getting a job soon. But I just I think he'd rather do it in Kentucky. Yeah. Thinking of him in the landscape this year, there were some overlays thematically to Bill Belichick on the landscape, right? Because everyone's like, oh, Belichick will get a job. Well, problem with Belichick is he came, you know, he's complicated. He he'd want some kind of personnel voice, perhaps, right? Like he's probably not going to be there for a long time, perhaps. So it limited his pool, who he was almost the gravitas and the success limited his pool in some ways, right? Like he did. He wouldn't take like a rebuilding job, you know, yeah. at a at a lesser franchise. So I, I do think with with John Calipari, it's interesting. Like it's not like he can go to forty programs, 
right? Like, and he's also sixty five. I mean, correct. there's too many programs are going to say, you know, we want to hire a forty eight year old or you know somebody yes. on the up and coming. And again, yes. as you mentioned, Cal is if he's not happy with something, he's going to let it be known. Mm-hmm. And not every program is going to want to deal with that. It's yes. just you know, there's there's a lot that comes with the Calipari experience, and you're going to get five star recruits, and you're probably going to win twenty five games more often than not, but there's going to be, you know, personality stuff that's not always going to, to mesh with his bosses. How could he construct rosters better? Just get older. I mean, yeah. you know, part of the appeal of him is I'm going to go get five-star recruits and we're going to get top three recruiting classes every year. And have it's a worth- combine. Right, Show exactly. It on ESPN. Yeah. And he's saying, you know, look at the, the money that our guys have made in the NBA. Now, I mean, especially when teams are, you know, I don't, his, he said everyone's 24 and 25, which is a bit of a stretch, but. Oh, yeah. He's Kentucky, been known to exaggerate slightly. Kentucky fans don't want to see, oh, Devin Booker made $300 million in the NBA. He's a success at Kentucky. They want to see him score 20 a game and go to a Final Four. That's what that's the success for them. They don't, you know. They don't want to see him on the bench against Wisconsin when their right, perfect season's right. getting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they're going to want to see wins now. They're not going to want to wait 10 years for a guy to be on his third contract and be like, you know what? He was a success at Kentucky when he won, you know, 22 games and got knocked out in the first round. So he's going to have to get older and he could still do the freshman thing because, again, that's part of his appeal. And, you know, I think he likes the fact that, oh, I got this five star and he went to the NBA, was a lottery pick and made a bajillion dollars. You're not really going to get that in the portal all that often, mm-hmm. but he's going to have to be open to let's start four guys that have been in the program that have been around college basketball, start maybe one freshman and then, you know, just have some sort of continuity in the program. Um, you know, when you get seniors and a couple, I mean, and, and the other part is the two best players they had on the floor in the Oakland game were Trey Mitchell and Antonio Reeves, two transfers mm-hmm. that in a different world are not on this Kentucky team because Trey Mitchell was a late addition after Bob Huggins got fired from West Virginia. He's actually 37. He might be in, in, Cal- <laughs> in Cal Perry years. He's 37. Um, and Antonio Reeves, I mean, he was rumored to want to leave a, a lot of the off season last year. So there was a chance that those guys weren't even there. Um, and he's going to have to go get more guys like that. You can get your Reed Shepherds and your Dillingham's and your DJ Wagner's two of those, three of those, and then kind of develop them as the season goes on. It's really hard to play four to five freshmen, even against Oakland. And we can, we saw Oakland's got, got dudes, they got old guys that have played together for a while. And in this day and age, it's just harder and harder to do it with, you know, guys that have played together for four months. And, and the other part is, the trade-off this year was, hey, we're going to play fast. We're going to play fast because we have all these freshmen. The defense was atrocious. Ooh. And like, again, it's it's when you have 18 year olds that have played together for three months, defense is not going to be there. And, you know, it's he's got to have some sort of continuity and he has to get older. Those are the two things. Again, he showed flexibility in his style. Can he do it with the roster also? And just the comments after the game where he said, you know, maybe we go to the portal. We got a great class coming in. We'll see what happens. Maybe we don't have to go in the portal. It just didn't give me a ton of optimism that he's ready to kind of transform his his roster theories. Yeah. PR 101, when you're in the middle of like a meltdown, is acknowledge the mistake, take yep. blame for the mistake, and then have a plan to fix the mistake. He didn't exactly do that. <laughs> yeah. His was like passively acknowledge the failures. Maybe I'll fix it. Maybe I won't. Yeah. And um, it, it did it all very upbeat, too. You know? Yeah. So, like, hey, college basketball's gotten older. It's like, well, yeah. okay. It's like- yeah. I should realize this a few years ago. Yes. No, that was it was like a it was like a very it was very interesting, uh, interesting epiphany. So we're gonna close the Kentucky Cal portion of this by me saying uh practice starts in October. What is who is running the Kentucky program if it's Cal? How how are they different? I think it's Cal. Um and and I think this has to be mentioned is that you take the money part out of it, the 33 million and all the, the money that he's owed and all that there's not a ton of viable replacements. And I think this is what people are forgetting where you just say, you know, if this was 10 years ago, if you're Kentucky, you fire Cal, you could probably get the top five coaches in the country and they're all want to come to Kentucky. You can get them for cheap and they'll they'll be in Lexington. No problem. Now these guys have humongous buyouts. And I think the gap has closed, you know, from an NIL perspective, from a recruiting perspective, you know, I don't like Nate Oates can look at Alabama and say, what can, what can't I do at Alabama that I can do at Kentucky? And, um, you know, Oates is not coming anyway, just signed a new contract. He's got $18 million buyout. And that's TJ Otzelberger, $17 million buyout. Tommy Lloyd just signed a new contract. Um, you know, Danny Hurley, just not coming. Like he's not leaving. UConn Mark Few, for- not coming. Right. You go down the list, you know, like even guys that maybe three years ago would have been names, Musselman, Sean Miller, Mick Cronin, they're all coming off bad years. Bruce Pearl, 64. And also if one of your complaints is that Calipari hasn't been passed the first weekend of the tournament since 2019, Guess who else hasn't been past the first week in 20, 2019? 
Bruce Pearl. So it's just it's Scott Drew. Just he just kind of made a big show of turning down Louisville to come back to Baylor. And he's if he doesn't get a new contract out of that, which he probably is, does he really go back on that a week later and say, you know what, I'm actually leaving Baylor. I'm going to Kentucky. It's just I don't see a, a real viable option for them unless they want to drop down to a you know a you know perceived tier two, tier three guy to come to Lexington. And, and again, Kentucky fans they want to win. And they still want recruiting classes. They still want to beat Kansas and Duke and Carolina for five-star recruits. So there's just a, a really thin line that you got to walk as a Kentucky coach. And not all these guys want to deal with that. Yeah. And don't underestimate the fact that, like, when Cal got that job, it was sort of the perfect collision mm-hmm. of a job needing a carnival barker and the consummate carnival barker right. of, you know, our generation in college basketball, right? And so many guys think of, like, Cal – you know, doing all his fantasy camps and doing all that, like doing all the stuff. Like Cal did seemingly more off court stuff than other stuff. And some of it great, by the way, a lot of charitable stuff. Like you know, uh, but that's just like the circus of Cal, and he yes. like redefined what a circus is as a college basketball coach the last fifteen years there. And a vast majority of these guys are like, no way, man. I'm yeah. not like, I'm not stepping in and being the ringleader there. Um, I think that's a little bit of why, and we're gonna get to some of this stuff. Why Dusty Bay went to Michigan. He's like, you know, I'm just going to coach basketball at Michigan, and they're really not going to bother me for six months. I'm not going to be at the gas station, and they're going to be like, how come you haven't offered that three-star from, you know, Bloomington South yet? Right. You know, like, he's just like, I need some, just need some unleaded to get to work. Right. I mean, Cal did an incredible job kind of marketing the program when it oh, needed yeah. to be marketed. And it became, if you're a good high school player, you're going to Kentucky. That mm-hmm. was it. I mean, Duke and Kentucky split up the top 10 recruits for like seven years. Mm-hmm. And that a, lot, a lot of that was because of Cal. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, you don't, I mean, I remember like people saying, oh, why can't they go after Jay Wright? Like when he was at Villanova, I remember him telling me, I don't want another job. I like being able to coach my team. I can go out to dinner in Philly with my family and my kids. And I don't have 10 people asking for autographs and photos. I go out to dinner. We go home. That's it. Like Lexington, you're not doing that. Like if he leaves his house, he's getting hounded for pictures. Like it's just, it's a different job and it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, I did think you made a good point here before we uh, before we kind of close this and transition to other uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky uh, situations in meltdown um, that Kentucky basketball and Alabama basketball 20 years ago, there's a huge difference. Right. But just with this avalanche of money from the uh, from the SEC, from the SEC network, from ESPN, from the CFP, like Mississippi State is like a pretty darn good basketball right. job. Like, you know, if the resources are marshaled there in the athletic department, you should be able to compete. You should be able to do all that stuff that you allegedly need to do to compete. Fly private and, you know, have every bell and every whistle and every bell and whistle can have their own bell and whistle. And you can be just fine um, in, in there. Just money's, money's changed the game in an elite job. You can craft around a coach and give Greg yep. Byrne credit for, for, for locking up Nate Oates. He found a guy who's pretty darn good. Right. And, um, and he's, he's, he's rolled, he's rolled with him and made sure that no one else is going to get him. And the buyout point you made, Jeff was great. I mean, uh, Mick Cronin's name would be floating around. It's $20 million. Right. You're not going to pay $20 million. Never mind taxes and dead money and all that stuff that, that would go along with it. To and that's, and that would be owed in one shot. Not like the buyout for to fire Cal. I mean, to buy out a coach, you're paying that basically in one shot. It varies, Plus, and you can yeah. negotiate it. But, but tax, yeah. taxes like, are another point yes. that you mentioned. I mean, it's just yes. these are in, in, incredible amounts of money. Yeah, and so I, my parting shot on it is this: if they do fire John Calipari, they better have a plan. Yep, because you could end up with a for all his postseason failures. There's a lot of good there in the you know yeah. in there. And you could end up in a much, in fact, statistically, you're probably going to end up with a worse coach, right? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it just, so you better have a plan because if Kentucky flails around in one of these searches and flops around, like that's bad ball because every eyeball in the sport is going to be on them. So it's a pretty, that's a pretty tough line to tightrope to have a, to have a coach at Kentucky lined up before you fire a coach to pay him 33 million to uh, to go away that would be that would be some ad and mitch and uh, i and, and I, I keep seeing they should call billy donovan and it's like a he has not shown any interest in coming out of college for years the bulls are currently in a in a in the play-in tournament so the earliest his season would end is april 20th or april 19th is kentucky really firing cal tomorrow and say you know what 
let's let the let's let the portal sit for a month, and then we'll we'll bring Billy in, and then he'll save the day. It's just I, I don't see. I really don't know if there's a real viable option that people are going to say, "Ooh, Kentucky can do that. That's a great decision." I just it just seems like a lot of guys that can't get out of their contracts or are not good enough or wouldn't say yes. And it seems like there's probably 15 of those before you get to somebody that seems like a good fit and, and is viable financially. It's like you said, I mean, you can't fire him and then kind of mess up this hire or, you know, get turned down by five or six guys. It's just, it's, it's the preeminent job when it comes to attention and popularity. And um, you know, it's Mitch Barnhart's got a tough decision to make and I just, I don't see him doing it. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of roadblocks in, in front of him. I don't think it's impossible, but it would take a, it would take a pretty good sized bake sale out there on the front (laughs) lawn. You know, you got to sell a lot of donuts and uh, um, pastries to, uh, to, 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 and you'd have to have like full alignment. Um, It'd be an interesting test of where Cal is with the money people, right? right? Like has he alienated them with the football comments and with the, with the griping and with the, you know, when he loses in the tournament and then go get another contract extension. Like there was always this, like every low moment he needed to be hugged. And right. it seems like it's, he's, he's exhausted some goodwill there. How much? We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, another place they could use some goodwill to, uh, to transition on is Louisville. Speaking of, speaking of flailing out, flailing yes. out in their searches. <laughs> yes. Um, which is at a, uh, at interesting crossroads. Uh, as you mentioned, Drew, Scott Drew, um, decided not to go there. Of course, uh, if Bryce Drew had a better last four minutes, maybe he could have he could have merged as the hot candidate there. Um, Grand Canyon. It looks like they're going to lose to Alabama um, after playing them quite tough for yeah. uh, thirty six minutes. Um, and obviously, Dusty May had the opportunity to uh, to go to Louisville. Chose Michigan. Um, where do thy Cardinal go, Jeff Borzello? It's it's there's not a lot of names floating around, and and this was. It, it feels like Louisville was caught a little flat footed on this one um, and very publicly also. I mean, they, they clearly were made a public pursuit of Scott drew didn't get him and then made a public pursuit of dusty Maine didn't get him. And so, you know, the lack of a plan C or at least a perceived plan C uh, has been pretty evident. The one name floating around right now is, is Pat, Pat Kelsey from Charleston. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, I mean, I, I like him. I think he would be a good hire. I think he has the energy to kind of reignite the program. Um, a basketball that, coach too right would, would that appease the louisville fan base which is sort of in meltdown mode ever since they lost a, a, a maybe their top option to michigan um that's kind of the only name really really floating around i mean you, you hear a little bit of amir abdul rahim and Shaheen holloway i think you know will wade could find himself in the mix at some point i, I th- they can go a million different directions and it just doesn't seem like like josh heard the athletic director has had kind of a tiered list of like this guy says no we go to this guy this guy this guy um, it, it does seem like they're they maybe take a breather and kind of reassess their candidates, but right now it seems like Pat Kelsey is, is maybe the the top guy on the board. So here's our our like sort of podcast conundrum question: Is Louisville a better basketball job than Michigan? So I polled a, a handful of, oh. of agents, and and this, this was when Ohio State was also open. Okay. And so I, I maybe ten or ten or twelve AD. I mean not ADs, uh, agents and coaches and mm-hmm. kind of industry people. Louisville got the most first place votes as the best job of the three. Interesting. Right. I, I, I thought that was very interesting. But a couple of people made the point. Even people that picked Louisville said there's a large contingent of coaches that do not want to be in any league but the Big Ten or the SEC moving forward. It's the it's the most financially secure. Your league is secure. There's your your future is pretty is on solid footing and the, you know, I think the ACC is fine for now, but there is, you know, there's questions. What's, what's going to happen to Louisville? Where's Louisville in five years? We don't really know. And I think that does scare away some people, but again, it's still, you know, when you kind of go down the checklist of what makes a good job, Louisville still would be ahead of Ohio state and Michigan in the eyes of a lot of people in the industry. And the fact that they have not got their preferred target twice now um, it's, you know, I think it, it goes back a little bit to, um, you know, you mentioned the SEC football money and, and the Big Ten also has football money. The ACC is not quite there right now. And, you know, if, if you're not in, in one of the power two, you know, your your future and what Louisville looks like five, ten years from now, we just don't really know. So we make a lot of jokes on this podcast. And one of our running jokes is that Reese Davis, Southern gentleman that he is, is so nice. If he's ever going to criticize someone, he says two nice things first. 
So I'm <laughs> going to say that I think Louisville is a fantastic basketball job. I think they have a great arena. I think they have great infrastructure, great tradition, right? It's one of the five yep. winningest programs. I mean, it's like there's a lot of awesome things about Louisville. That said, I think the, think about everything that's happened in the last week. Like that awful Virginia Colorado State game was like six days ago. Like yes. that, that. So in the last week, we have had the college football playoff uh, introduced. We have had Clemson's lawsuit to get out of the ACC. And then we've had this sort of blitzkrieg of wonderful NCAA games, which we will talk about eventually, by the way. And I really think that, and I, I said this a little bit on, on our Wednesday pod, but I really think that Monday, um, which seems like it was you know six months ago, will be remembered as a pivotal day in the history of college athletics. Because that's the day, obviously, that the... Uh, CFP deal comes and it codifies that codified the financial disparity between the SEC and Big Ten and everybody else. And it is also the the same day. And God, this might have been Tuesday. I, I may have my day mixed up. Oh, it was Tuesday. Then you had Clemson obviously filing the lawsuit uh, with the Big Ten, which came on the same day. So the, you know, long story short, like that to me is like the the fork in the road where where everything changed. And there was a much better argument for for Louisville over Michigan, which is a close and it, it, it's a good debate, right? Like it's the re the reason why you you did that in the article and pulled those people was because you think you're going to you don't do a poll where it's going to be twelve zero, right? Like right. you knew it was going to be uh, you know divided answers. And I really think that like five years from now we won't look at that as as much of a question. Now I'm certainly not saying the ACC is going to imminently you know expand or anything like that, but there's certainly just two searing signs that that league is going to be drastically different or the bell cows of that league want it to be different. Now, whether that will be or not, we'll see, but that's, uh, that's essentially where, where that is right now. You know, a lot of people got glee to poke, poking at Greg Sankey for his comments, CSPN about the future of the tournament and expansion in, uh, in, in, in this week. And I'll, certainly they, they've earned, they earned the right to poke. And uh, I, I'm not commenting on that as much as I'm coming. I, like my thought this week as I watched us is all to be like financial distribution in many ways becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like yeah. if you are getting more money, you are going to get better players, right? Like there's a reason why the Dodgers are usually better than the Royals. Now the Royals can come up and win the World Series like they did a couple yeah. years ago and good for them. But for the most part, if you have the highest payroll, you're going to put forth the best teams. And so while the, in this moment, in this, and the tournament's been great, right? Like it's been awesome to watch. I do wonder if, you know, it, it, it's been interesting that that Sankey storyline has sort of remained in the backdrop, yep. um, literally amongst these like seismic shifts where we are, which would indicate at least in a financial way that, and again, I'm not saying it's the SEC and Big Ten are going to come down. Big Ten hasn't won the national title since 2000. Um, SEC obviously struggled in this tournament. But there's th those programs are going to be better because yeah. the better coaches are going to go there. You know, the six hundred thousand dollar assistant coach is going to have a hard time staying at Iowa State now. And I'm just throwing that as an example. I have no idea. I'm going to see some guy in the locker room and he's going to be like, "Man, I wish I made six hundred grand <laughs> in Boston you're, this you, weekend." <laughs> people are going to think you're, you're people are going to think you're reporting that an Iowa State assistant might be leaving for the SEC. Yeah, but like I'm all hypothetical. It's okay. it's just going to be harder to yeah. keep talent. It's like in business, right? When you know Apple pulled the, when the iPhone pulled away from the uh, Android, they could probably afford the best engineers, right? So then the iPhone kept getting better, and that's probably a clunky analogy. But the the, the point is, there are now thirty four, right? Eighteen and sixteen, yeah. In those in those two leagues, and they have now how much of that money is funneled to basketball is a legit question because that's different everywhere else, but. I really think from from the big picture when we're talking about a place like Louisville, proud tradition, awesome history, like you know, great eras and runs, awesome scandals too. By the way, um, it's really been it's really been a great, entertaining college basketball program all the way through. It's just going to be harder to to do that. Now, I do this as UConn is you know beat Northwestern by half a hundred on my TV tonight, and so there there it, it is not going to happen overnight, and it's not just immediately going to arrive this way. But I do think I think you're naive if you don't think the trend lines are pointing that way. Yeah, and the other thing about Louisville, in addition to all that, is you're taking over a program in the absolute doldrums. I mean, they're down there with Cal, Cal and DePaul 
over the last three, four years, whatever. Like it is in rough shape. The fan base is like incredibly apathetic or has become that way. And now that you are not Scott Drew or Dusty May, who most of the fan base seem to want, you're going to have to now win them over and you're going to have to reignite the fan base. You're going to have to fill up the yum center. You're basically going to have to rebuild an entire roster because everyone's either transferring or not good enough. And it's just, I mean, you're taking that job. And again, the people are saying, oh, they should take a swing at Oates and Shaka and all these guys. Like those guys are not leaving for, for a total, total rebuild in a place they haven't been with a fan base that right now needs like some convincing to come back into the fold. Um, it's, it's an uphill climb for whoever takes that job. Um, again, it can be a great job and it has been a great job. And on the surface, it's still probably a top 10, top 12 job if you ask people to rank them. But it's got some work to do to get back to that level. Could Rick Pitino come back? I say no. I say yeah. no. I mean, that would, that would be a, I mean, I think that's a Louisville like fever dream. I think that would, that would make everyone happy, but that seems, seems a little bit far fetched. Yeah. Money and desperation can, you know, be a pretty powerful collision. Well, Billy Donovan at Kentucky and Rick Pitino back at Louisville. Like, Let's 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 get that rivalry going again. Yeah, I'd watch that Netflix special. I was gonna say, I'll crazy, I'll crazier, thing, crazier things have happened. Maybe That's, not, actually. I take that back. Yeah. I've never got the sense that Billy like really is is dying to go back. Like in you know, people always bring up Brad Stevens, right? Like all these guys that have been in the NBA for a while, man. Whew, like I mean, I, I mean they got tired of of the recruiting back before NIL. I mean, they don't want yes. to deal with that stuff anymore. And now it's it's ten times well, for some guys it's better and more fun and whatever. It's ten times worse than it was then. If you didn't like recruiting, then you would absolutely, you know, abhor recruiting at this point. Yeah, no, it's it is. They are uh, they are beautiful games and terrible businesses, right? Yeah, like like college football is the same way. Co- college basketball is the same way. Let's let's sort of rapid fire through some of these jobs here. Um, and we we touched on SMU. We didn't finish. Uh, they have money. They have ambition, and they have money. Who can they hire? I, th- I mean, like I said before, I think it's a job of interest to a lot of Power Five guys. I mean, like I think you'll see Eric Musselman involved, or at least interested in it. You'll see Chris Jans from Mississippi State linked to it. Buzz Williams has been a name thrown at me. The one name that is kind of floating around the past couple of days has been Andy Enfield at USC. Interesting. Um, he's a guy that people kind of earmarked a couple of months ago as, hey, maybe I can get if if I can get a spot somewhere else, maybe I'd go there. And he just had a pretty bad season with with what was the number one recruit in the country. He had Bronny James. Uh, maybe he just wants a fresh start. Uh, you know, there's going to be USC fans that are saying, hey, he disappointed with an incredibly talented roster. And, and maybe they put him on the hot seat in a year or two. And, and he'll say, hey, I don't want to deal with that. Let me go get a ton of money, a new five or six year contract from SMU and be happy. So that's a, that's a name that's kind of been floating around. But it's I do been think for a long time, right, Jeff? It's yeah. like 12, 13 years. Yeah, longer than longer. I mean, he was he was hired. I want to say he was hired the same time offer was hired at, at UCLA. Yeah, he was hired uh, right in the wake of the Dunk yes, City. Yes, um, yes. And that was 2011, 12? I should know this. 2013. All right, I'm off. So he's still been there 11 years. Yeah. Um, it's a lo- that, that's like, you know, that's two lifetimes right. in this business. Yeah. Like, you just, so, if you make it past six, like, you know, you should, they're, they're, you should, they should throw you a party. So. And I, I think that's the kind of guy that they're going to have to, I mean, again, you don't fire Rob Lanier after winning 20 games. And then go hire someone that's, you know, a mid-major name or something like that. You go after a kind of a heavy hitter. And it just, it seems like that's kind of their, their target demographic right now. What can they pay? Like, is, is, is that on the street right now? Like, can they pay 6 million bucks? Could they pay Calipari 10 million bucks? I think they could. I mean, I think they, I think they could go up as high as they want. And it sounds, I mean, again, the names that, that I just threw around the Enfields and the buzzes, Mm -hmm. Hustleman, they're all making four-ish. Yeah. Like they're they're going to have to pay, you know, a competitive salary of four or five if they want to and again i mean dusty may is only making three seven and um i think they're gonna have to pay more than that to, to get a, a guy of that level muscleman would fit there in a lot of ways because he's got a bit of a carnival barker to him you know what i mean the same term i use for cal like he'll take a shirt off and you know what i mean like there, like there yeah, is yeah. like a there's a showman to him and that's a place that doesn't have a ton of history. It doesn't right. have a fan base. Like their football program has been very successful. If you look at their games, like there's nobody there. Right. Like it's just, it, oh, he'll get people there. Must will get people there. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I think that's kind of got to be a prerequisite for whoever gets that job. I mean, you know, yeah. if, if, if the expectations are, we're going to be competing with the best of the best, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, getting, getting a, you know, student section, getting, getting a sold out crowd. That's part of, of being, of competing at the top. Sure. 
Yeah. And in Enfield, who's who's been a generally successful coach, is not bad. Um, right. He has this like wild story, but he's a generally pretty charmless guy. Like he's pretty straightforward. Like he's not he's not the kind of guy who's going to like go on at six radio shows in the morning and go to the fraternity houses. And if he does, it would be against his right. general uh, general personality. He's a little bit of a a, a blander, in, introverted guy. He doesn't really have that showman in him, which is why he's been a head coach in L.A. for 11 years and is relatively anonymous. Like still yeah. the first thing you think about with Andy Enfield is Dunk City at Florida Gulf Coast. Like there's Good not point. a, yeah. they, they, they've been good at USC and they've been better right. than at USC historically. They made some dunderhead hires at USC over the years, the Henry Bibbies, they brought back Kevin O'Neill. Like they've just sort of, you know, fumbled that job left and right in a lot of ways. And he's kind of got it in that fair way. He's done a good job. So um, yeah, that, that that's uh, SMU just sort of like buying its way into the mix is like fascinating, yeah. right? It's uh, even, um, let's go on to the job that just filled uh, Sunday night, West Virginia, uh, for our West Virginia Mountaineer fans, what are they getting in Darren DeVries? He's a guy who is, you know, he's had as much success in the past four years as any program in the country outside of Houston, pretty much. I mean, there's a stat that this was entering, I think the final week of the season, and only two programs have won at least 25 games, uh, the last four years. And it was Houston and Drake. Um, and that just kind of shows what DeVries has done. And he, he obviously is bringing, his son Tucker with him, the two-time Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year. But he had success before Tucker got there. Um, I just think he's a really good coach. He has a ex- ton of experience at the high major level. He was an assistant at Creighton. Mm-hmm. So I think he'll be able to recruit. I think he'll be able to get players. You know, West Virginia, last summer at least, they had a ton of NIL to to give to guys in the portal. If that continues, he's already starting with his son. That's a pretty good piece to build around. You go out and you get guys in the portal. And, and again, I think they can compete pretty quickly if they make the right decisions in the portal. They didn't do that last year. They paid a lot of money to a lot of players that didn't fit. Um, so I think DeVries is good. I mean, he was he, he was on the list at Michigan. If Dusty had mm-hmm. said no, he was somewhere on the list. He talked to Oklahoma State. He talked to Vanderbilt. I mean, he was a guy that three or four schools really wanted this cycle. Uh, and, and from that perspective, I think West Virginia, they moved pretty early on him. I mean, he was he was near yeah. the top of the board for, for weeks now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think they kind of jumped the line or were at the head of the line for him. Uh, the past couple of days. And I think it's, it's a pretty good hire. Yeah. I was l- looking at uh, DeVries' record uh, last couple of days, six straight 20 win seasons, uh, four straight 25 plus three and say tournaments the last four years. That's a, that's a, that's a lot, you know, that's a backbone of success. Um, you know, that- and it's at a place that, you know, wasn't competing for, for tournaments all that often. It's in a good, it's in a good league. And um, you know, he's, he's really taken that, that job or that school up to a, uh, you know, a consistent competitor at the top of the league, which had not been done at Drake in forever. We will go now to Oklahoma State, a funny job um, where it is now. I contend that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, Oklahoma State was a rocking basketball environment. It had a ton of great players, had a ton of tradition. I really think that the, the arrival of the NBA in Oklahoma coincided with a dip in basketball, both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, quite frankly. But it feels like the environment at Gallagher, Iba, it doesn't have the same juice it used to. You know, you got you got a much better and much bigger Big Twelve, a um, little less regional. Um, how good of a job is Oklahoma State right now? I know they had some NIL struggles. Uh, right. Mike Gundy's general reticence towards NIL, I think, has permeated that athletic department a little bit. Just how good of a job is this right now, Jeff? I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, 10, 15 years ago. A little longer than that. I mean, when Eddie, Eddie Sutton was there. It was a great job. I mean, it was you know top half Big Twelve job probably, and and now it's just it's not. Um, they have not had any real success in, since. I mean, probably since Eddie Sutton was there. I mean, that's five coaches ago. Wow. Um, five yeah. coaches. Yeah, I mean, they had Sean Sutton. They had four. They had Brad Underwood for a year, and then they had Mike Boyton. Yeah. Um, they have not been out of the first weekend of the tournament since Eddie Sutton in two thousand five. Um, wow. yeah. So it's been a while. And again, you mentioned the NIL issues. That's a and it's publicly kind of talking about Mike Boynton kind of publicly complained about it a little bit. Um, that's going to be a, something that coaches are going to have to ask them. Now, this is also a job where, in theory, it has money to spend and has resources and things like that and and donors to. I mean, they bought out Mike Boynton. That was about seven million or so. Um, you bought, probably bought a pretty good roster for them out there, right? Mike. <laughs> right. So you know, if they if they put money into the program, which from what I've been told and what I've heard, that's kind of a a talking point for them in this search that they're going to have some money to spend on NIL. If that's there, you know, and you can get Gallagher, Iba back rocking again, it's, it's not a bad job, but 
it's not what it was 10, 15 years ago. I mean, if you're kind of ranking the available jobs, you're probably putting Washington ahead of Oklahoma State at this point, um, which you which you would not have done uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a very fair point. Um, let's go to Washington since you brought it up. Uh, where are the uh, where are the Huskies right now? They're down an AD and a coach. Um, where do where do they move and how quick? Uh, Danny Sprinkle has been kind of the name that's been floating around for pretty much before Mike Hopkins was let go uh, down the stretch of the regular season and, and obviously finished out the season. But uh, Sprinkle's been the guy. I, I still think he's probably in good shape there, even though, as you mentioned, they don't have an athletic director. Uh, Troy Dana left for Nebraska a week ago. Uh, I'm still under the impression that Sprinkle's the guy. I mean, he won a tournament game before getting uh, blown out on Sunday by Purdue. But, you know, he's done a tremendous job at Montana State, now at uh, Utah State, three straight tournaments, first outright. Mountain West title, regular season title at Utah State, first tournament win for the program since I want to say 2001. Um, so he's a, wow. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, I think so. Right. What, a, what, a, what a pull by you. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, it's a good hire. I, I, he was a guy that, you know, like DeVries, he was involved in a couple of different searches. And I think Washington kind of, you know, made him the focus pretty well in advance in order to avoid him kind of slipping somewhere else. A couple of people have asked me the last few days, well, do you think the AD leaving will affect, uh, you know, Danny Spurgill's candidacy? I was like, well, if somebody offered you three times your salary, and I'm just making up that number, by the way, but a, typically a Mountain West million dollar salary to a Big Ten $3 million salary is just a, right. a, a basic jump. But I legit don't know what he was making or what he would make, but it's probably two and a half X. Like I, that's a that's a safe estimate. So. You know, I would I would jump into the unknown for two and a half times my salary if, uh, you know, if 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 offered. I don't know about you, Jeff. I don't know how much you value your bosses if you want the oh, security yeah. of knowing who they yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. And then on, and on the other side, it feels like and I mean, you know, Troy Tannen better than I do, I think. But I don't feel like he would leave him in a lurch saying, you know, I'm going to fire the guy and then not be around to hire his replacement. I think he I mean, I think he did a, a lot of groundwork and legwork on, on Danny Sprinkle to kind of lead leave the search in good shape, at least. Yeah, the, the the feeling is that it that it is still headed that way. By the time folks are listening to this, there may be some uh, there may be some official clarity uh, official clarity on uh, on that. I believe Danny Sprinkle's father played football at Washington, so which is like one of those nuggets. Usually in college football, it's he has a beach house near there, so like oh yeah, he's got a beach house on thirty A, so he's going to want the Florida State. Job, and, so. and, and basketball always seems to be like a father in law lives in lives in that town. That always <laughs> that, that always seems to be. Oh, father-in-law's got a lot of say in that one. It's like, okay, yeah, seems to seems to pop up every now and then. Well, whose father-in-law lives near Nashville? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's another one. I think we should have some movement on in the next couple of days. Um, uh, I think that Mark Byington uh, is in. You know, he's a, a name there that we've been hearing pretty heavily, and I, I don't think he hurt his candidacy by beating Wisconsin the other day in the first round of the tournament. He's done a tremendous job. Thirty-one wins, thirty-two wins. This yeah, season. 32. Duke was, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wisconsin was 32. Duke would have been 33. Didn't quite yeah. happen. Uh, yeah, it old, didn't happen. But and, and I, I think, you know, he did a tremendous job. And Hard uh, to win 32 college basketball games. And they wouldn't have made the tournament without the, the conference tournament, which yeah. a lot of people have uh, pointed out over the past couple of days. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it's his first NCAA tournament appearance, but um, he's got a little bit of high major experience recruiting. You know, he was a, a assistant, I want to say Virginia and Virginia Tech for a year okay. apiece. So, so he's right. been at that level and um, it's a rare up, double. You get both. Yeah. And, and it was, and it was separate. It was like, it was, it was separated by seven or so years somewhere else. But um, yeah, I mean, if, if he ends up being a guy, I think that's a good hire. I mean, you know, we've heard Amir Abdurrahim linked to it. Uh, Pat Kelsey's been linked to it. Josh shirts who, uh, you know, we reported last week is, was in talks with St. Louis. So um, still talking. Yeah. <laughs> so a week later, they're still chopping it up. Um, you think they won't fill that until, the, cause didn't they make the NIT finals? Yeah, they, I mean, they won again today. So yeah, they got, so the they UN2 to go to, well, it used to be to go to New York, right? But now you go to yeah, Hinkle. I think, yeah, you go to Hinkle. I think next year, maybe you go to Vegas or something. Uh, but this, this it feels like when when uh, Texas Tech hired Grant McCaslin, um, I, you know, they they the news started break, breaking in about this time last year, and yeah. they kept winning. And they, I think they won the NIT or made the Final Four. And like it, it was officially announced like April 5th, and everyone's like, oh, I thought that was announced like two, two and a half, three weeks ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like Vanderbilt is is winding things down along with a few other spots in you know, Washington. We mentioned uh, Stanford's another one. I think they're probably winding right. things down. Uh, you know, Kyle Smith has been perceived to be the favorite there for, I don't know, months uh, and you know, led Washington state to 
first tournament since Tony Bennett did a great job there. He's had success at, at San Francisco and at Columbia. So he fits kind of that high academic mold. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, a right now it's a, an in, intra conference move, but in about three months, it's, it will not be. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's quickly look back on the NCAA tournament. What was your favorite moment, Jeff Borzano? I think my favorite moment would be, I think it was the, the Colorado Florida ending. I mean, that's that it was uh, to me, that was the most entertaining game of the, not the best game, but the most entertaining game of the tournament, 102 to hundred Walter Clayton, um, from the parking lot. Yeah. I mean, he was ridiculous. I think he had 33 that game. He hit, I don't know, their last 12 points, including, like you said, from the parking lot, about 30 footer to tie it up. And then it won, you know, KJ Simpson's shot with that hit seemingly every part of the rim and, and then bounced in it, that, that, game i mean it's just the you know the react the swings from one end to the other oh florida force overtime nope colorado's got it It was i mean i love that game and i think so kj simpson's shot uh would probably be where i stand on on my favorite moment yeah that was one of my least favorite moments because i had florida going in the final four and i was like they were dead and buried in that game and they came back and i got like i got oh i could be a genius after all hope and that was quickly extinguished (laughs) as uh as it should be i just refused to pick a final four without like some type of outlier in it. So they were my, right. they, they were my outlier for better, for worse. Things kind of opened up for him too. As, as like the day went on, I was like thinking about it, but oh, well, they, uh, they at least gave us a, uh, they at least got us off the couch one afternoon with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of good uh, ball. Who, uh, who's your favorite player, your breakthrough player? Like who like just busted out and uh, you, you, you got, you got some giddiness watching. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that um, Golki is probably the the popular pick. Who was the dude from uh, Fairly Dickinson that beat Kentucky that transferred to Bryant? I think. Oh, uh, the, the guy from uh, St. Peter's. Oh, uh, St. Peter's. Yeah. I'm sorry, Doug Eater. Yeah, Doug, Doug Eater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had like oh. the he had a mustache. Maybe maybe Golki could have could have done like a mustache or something with his hair to maybe get a little more pop. Um, yeah, the kid from Yale was another one that. Yes. Pula Pula Kitas Pula Kitas. Yeah, um, I don't Reese know. is the a, pronunciation expert on the pod. He, he I'm had, just gonna, I'm gonna one, let you roll. He had one step back baseline jumper that it seemed to hit the ceiling and come back down. And like as soon as he shot it, I was like, "That's going to be in one shining moment." Like that's yeah. the kind of shot that is going to be in it. Sure. Um, but I probably stole the two best answers if you had one yourself. But I will say DJ Burns at NC State, not a breakthrough guy. He's been around. I mean, he's played in the tournament for. He's at Winthrop. He was at Winthrop. He signed with Tennessee out of out of yeah. uh, high school, so he's been around. But the should have been a left guard. Dude, I mean, he's an incredible passer, unbelievable footwork's, hands, footwork's unbelievable though. Right, yeah. and to me, like the NC State story. I mean, they're an ACC school, so they're not a Cinderella. But you look back on whatever thirteen days ago at this point, they were trailing Louisville at halftime of the first round of the ACC tournament. If they lose that game, there's a chance Kevin Keats is fired the next day. I mean, they, he, there was pressure on him. The fan base seemed ready to move on. Like, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility. That could have been his last game as NC State coach. And then they go on to win the ACC tournament, five wins in five days. They win the first round. They win the second round. They're in the Sweet 16. Keats has a raise. Keats gets an extension. I mean, it's an incredible two weeks uh, that really only happens in March in college basketball. And to yes. me, it's just an incredible story that maybe isn't getting enough attention because it's NC State. It's an ACC team. But yeah. it's it's really incredible. Yeah. Who puts in a contract if you win the ACC tournament? You get what an arbitrary, weird thing to get yep. a two-year extension off. Of. I can I, if you reach the NCAA tournament, absolutely get he extended. Also, if you win your conference, that's probably even a better metric then because you could get lucky and win the conference tournament, and not be very good. But that was like I was like a contract. I'd never heard of a contract extension tied to a conference tournament victory in my he, career. In I'm his, sure they in exist. His, just, in his original contract, I think. I'm almost positive he had a some sort of lever he could pull where if they got hit with NCA infractions from the previous regime, he could trigger an automatic two year extension if he, if he wanted to. And it's like, why would anybody ever say I don't want that two year two years added onto my deal? Well, just uh, it, the buyout works the other way too, though. Yeah, if it fair. was a two year extension, you had to pay more to leave. But um, yeah, I mean, he's just he's had a couple of a uh, couple of different triggers that he's now hit, and then he's. I mean, I think he's tied down there until I don't know, 2028, 2029 at this point. So he's got he's got new life there in, in Raleigh. Yeah. And uh, shout out to Casey Morcel, uh, St. John's College high grad, played for my buddy Pappy in there. And uh, 
Pat's obviously rooting hard for him as Pat battles ALS. So it's been fun to uh, see him really seize the stage at this late point in his career. He's played, he's played awesome in, I, I feel like I've watched NC State so like more in the last 10 oh, yeah. days than I have in the last five years. <laughs> hey, seven, seven wins in 13 days and then all of yeah. them pretty much on national TV. Um, yes. It's hard to, it's hard to avoid them. Yeah, no, truly, uh, truly awesome. And, it's what we talk on the game day pod about uh, Saturday football versus Sunday football. And there are just quintessential college basketball things and a wild conference tournament run that, uh, yeah. that, that avalanches into a sweet 16 crashing. And um, I do think it's a little fitting as we see Duke in the sweet 16 and we see Carolina in the sweet 16 with NC state as the ACC is at this crossroads. And I think it's fair to say um, they're certainly, you know, the, the, and the judge, Yes, sure. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> public public enemy number two of the ACC. Yeah, keep those units <laughs> flowing to. Uh, well, it used to be Greensboro. It's Charlotte now, but um, keep, keep the units uh, keep the units flowing. Yes, I. There'll be some we're, we're not dead yet quotes coming out of some uh, some cavernous gym on uh, on Wednesday and Thursday as uh, coaches stump for their league because coaches do nothing better than stump for their league, even if they don't want to be in it. Um. All right, let's 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 peek ahead a little bit, uh, Jeff, and uh, get a little taste of uh, of what we can expect next weekend. Um, I'm going to start in the East. I'm biased. My you know a lot of my game watching has been tailored around you and I are going to be in Boston covering yep. that uh, covering that East Regional. Um, I think that Illinois uh, Iowa State game is going to be a, one of the best games you know in the tournament Sweet 16. Just two dynamic teams that. Again, because where they're located, they're not under the radar to college basketball fans. But I think to the general bracket filling, you know, casual fan, they are a little under the radar. What pops about that matchup to you? It's the number two offense in the country in Illinois versus the number two defense in the country in Iowa State. Um, and, you know, Illinois is playing incredibly well lately. Terrence Shannon and Marcus Domosk have been you know, maybe the best wing duo in the country over the past couple of months. And Iowa State is just going to, I mean, this is what they do to pretty much everyone, including Houston just grind them down and make a play in the half court and, and just make life very, very difficult for them. Um, and I, I did pick Illinois to win it when the bracket came out that picked them to beat Iowa state, hmm. you know, that's going to be, if they have to do a lot in the half court, I think they're going to have some trouble, but um, to me, like that's a fascinating contrast uh, in that game. Yeah. We're on, we're on the clock here. Talkative and undisciplined is one of our podcast monitors and I, mo- monikers, excuse me. And I feel like I've lived up to that tonight. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to bounce around a little bit. NC state Marquette. Uh, I love seeing the emotion from Shaka smart today for a sweet 16, uh, for him since 2013, he joins one of two fired Texas coaches in the sweet 16. Um, uh, Rick Barnes. Oh yeah. Rick Barnes be another one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who beat Texas to get there. Um, to, to, uh, to go, makes you wonder if the problem is the coach or the problem is Texas, you know? (laughs) Um, how is that matchup with NC state? Uh, they finally get the rest, by the way. I was just tired watching them. I know. I mean, I, to me, if Marquette, if their guards play the way they did, if I mean, Tyler Kolick seems to be healthy. I mean, those six games he took off at the end Crafty. of the regular season. I mean, he was incredible today in the second half. Did whatever he wanted um, against Colorado. And the Cam Jones, you know, he had foul trouble today. But when he was on the floor in the first half, he was lights out. And he's been on an absolute tear the last 10, 11 games of the season. So I think those two guys kind of gives them a chance to beat anybody in the country, including Houston and maybe not UConn. I don't know if anybody could beat them, but um, the, it's the, to me, it's going to be fat. Like Oso Iguodaro just dealt with Eddie Lampkin of Colorado for mm-hmm. 40 minutes. And now he's got to go deal with DJ Burns for 40 <laughs> minutes. I mean, that's two brutal, like very unique big men, like yeah. just space eaters on the inside, different players. I mean, Burns is incredibly skilled that we just talked about. Um, that's going to be tough. I mean, nobody's really come up with an answer to, we're going to throw the ball into Burns. You're going to have to triple team him and he's going to find someone because he's an awesome passer and we're going to score. Um, Shaka has a few, a few days to figure that out. And I think he will, but I'm intrigued to see what they do to kind of slow him down. So DJ Burns is probably the, one of the five most compelling players who's emerged in the last, you know, the last two weeks, obviously he's been around and, you know, he was great for Winthrop. I remember he was in the floor when they played Villanova in yep. that first round game. Everyone thought Villanova was going to lose and then they didn't. Um, What's his like professional reality? Like, what can what can DJ Burns do? I again, my nickel opinion here um, is that he's not an NBA player. I don't think that's yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know. think he is either. But can he go to like uh, Italy and just like dominate there? I mean, he has like a little European flair to his game, and obviously a great passer. Like, what's his 
what, what or, or should should we get uh should we get somebody to sign him and bring him to camp and try to uh try to get him you know get him as get him as a left tackle i mean, i think he could play in europe i mean okay. he's just to me he's just too skilled i mean in europe is is more of a finesse type of deal i mean it's not overly explosive and it's not the up and down kind of mm more athletic version of the NBA. I mean, the NBA is obviously incredibly skilled also, but I'm, it's just a little bit of a slower game. And again, I mean, I think you, I don't know if teams are going to run their offense through him like NC state does, but sure. it's it's hard for me to imagine that he can't make money overseas okay. for yeah. several years, kind of doing what he does. Yeah. No, I, that, that's, that's what I, uh, that, that's what I assumed. Um, Creighton, Tennessee is a fascinating game, right? You got a, a, a program. How many how many times did Creighton score out of the timeout the other night in Pittsburgh, right? Like, I mean, it just seemed like every time. And uh, Tennessee won despite shooting four percent from the field. I think that was the, that was the number. Yes, uh, they were just brutal. And but give them credit, they found a way to uh, to win in a phone booth. Um, what do you like about that matchup, Jeff? Well. You mentioned the, the Creighton Oregon double overtime game. To me, like that was a fascinating kind of tactical. You don't usually see, especially in Batman, you don't always see kind of adjustments as they happen. But Oregon did the same exact thing every time for the first like 43 minutes of the game. They just ran a high ball screen with Kusnard and and uh and Folly Dante. Yeah. And then they would get a basket out of it. And then and they were the only ones who scored the whole right, second half, exactly. and I think first yeah. overtime. Yeah. Yeah. And then McDermott switched it where he had Kalkbrenner kind of double team kusnar to get the ball out of his hands and you just kind of saw it happen in real time that they did it for the first time all game twice in a row and oregon never really adjusted um so that was fascinating to me and and i think they're gonna have to come up with a, a way to do something similar against tennessee because that you know dalton connect is maybe the best guard in the country this season and if you if they have the same success that oregon did in that kind of two-man mm-hmm. game high pick and roll you know creighton's gonna get torched by connect by connect but i picked creighton in the final four I haven't seen anything yet that kind of makes me think that they're going to lose to Tennessee, but they're going to have to really figure out what to do on that high pick and roll or else connect to go for 40. Connect to me is the kind of player that Calipari hasn't figured out how to land to balance yeah. his roster. Is that fair? Like, yeah. You know, and I, was, and I, I, I think he would, he would look at connect and, you know, I, he was not, you know, widely perceived as a top three, top five, whatever player in the portal mm-hmm. last spring. And I would imagine, you know, Calipari sees, okay, this guy averaged, 20 game on a Northern Colorado team that wasn't that good. You know, he's not going to make it at Kentucky. And uh, honestly, I mean, like if you're Cal, I'm not sure you're really blaming him for not taking Dalton connect. Um, But that's the kind of guy that he needs. He needs someone that's been around the block. He's played in college for four years. Um, I mean, connect was a Juco player before he got to Northern Colorado. He's, he's, he's played at a bunch of different gyms and a bunch of different levels. And he's really good. And, And it's that kind of like, tested guy would help Kentucky dramatically, but you know, he's, he's one of the more fascinating. I mean, if he, he can go for 40 against Creighton and be the, and then 40 against Purdue and be the, the tournament hero um, of this year. So I do have Creighton winning, but I'm really fascinated to see what they do with connect. Well, I think we're going to wrap up here, Jeff, lovely having you on. We appreciate your great hair and your great insight. Uh, Thanks for coming on the College Game Day podcast. Everybody, enjoy the games this uh, this weekend. Hopefully, Jeff and I get to uh, we get three good ones here in Boston and maybe uh, enjoy a cold beverage in between. This is the Game Day podcast. Please subscribe, download, wherever you get your podcast, and leave us nice reviews. 